The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome to Oxford United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Caleb. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning for worship as we gather as one body in the power of the Holy Spirit to lift up our world, which is in crisis, that we might all receive the peace that Christ offers to us. As we get into our service this morning, we do have a couple of announcements for you. First of all, as I say every week, take some time during the service today to fill out that yellow card. And you can take that yellow card and any tithes and offerings that you have brought with you this morning, and you can deposit those in the baskets at the conclusion of today's service. The first announcement this morning, you can see it right there in the bulletin, is that next Sunday we will have only one service. It'll be at 10.30 that morning, it will be an all-sung service. It'll be a service of music and communion. Uh, we did this for the lessons and carols back in uh, Christmas season, and it's a great way, I think, to celebrate this season of the life of the church. So we invite you to come here and be here next Sunday for that all-sung service. Also, on Saturday, May 11th, we're going to have our next serve day. We had a serve day last month uh, where we after services actually went out and did various projects either around the church or in the community and we invite you to come on that Saturday May 11th from 11 to 1 as we do work around this church but also through tops and some other agencies uh, if you are interested in signing up for that we do have a sign up genius uh, form that went out in the Friday update or you can call the office for more information Next, I just wanted to bring to your awareness, because some of you might have seen on the news that there's this stuff going on in the United Methodist Church. It's called General Conference, and uh, usually I wait until after General Conference meets. General Conference, for those of you that don't know, is when all the global United Methodists gather together uh, to make decisions about the church and all of that. And the last time they were able to meet was 2016 together as one body truly together uh, because we had this thing called the pandemic that interrupted the one in 2020 and technically this year the 2024 general conference is actually a 2020 general conference i know it's very confusing but uh, i just wanted to say that we usually tell you what happened at general conference after the fact um, because it's much easier to communicate afterwards because we never know what's going to happen at General Conference. And so I promise we will give out information about what happens afterwards. I just will say, I always caution, don't get your uh, sources mixed up when it comes to where you're getting news about the denomination, uh, particularly through news agencies. Reporters do a great job, um, but sometimes they misunderstand some of our Methodist things that we like to do as Methodists. Even Methodists uh, misunderstand what we do as Methodists sometimes. In fact, this past week I saw a news story that said one of our bishops was the president of the denomination, which is completely false. They were just presiding over the conference that morning. There's a big difference between president and presiding over something. And so I just say that we'll, we'll communicate with you uh, this is the this next upcoming week is the final week of general conference and we'll promise to communicate anything that happens uh, that would be worth bringing to your attention that's all the announcements I have for you but our youth have a special announcement about their youth trip and the fundraiser that they are doing so in June the OUMC youth is going on a mission trip and we went here last year but we're excited to go back to Freaks Kentucky and we had an opportunity to side a shed, build a ramp, and form new connections with locals, each other, and Christ. And in order to return, we need fundraising help to cover transportation, housing, meals, and materials for projects. So if you're interested or able to support, you can find a donation tree outside of the fellowship hall after service, and the tree has envelopes labeled one through 50, and the number of each envelope corresponds with the amount of money you can donate inside. So like if you picked up a number 25 envelope, you leave $25 inside. And there's also a line of other envelopes. So if you don't see the amount that you would like to donate, you can put money into the other envelope. So thank you for supporting, whether it's financially or through prayer. And we look forward to updating you about our trip. Yeah, and you'll find that directly below. And I. I love the, the Henderson mission trip last year and this year. They're going during July 4th week, 
which means they get to watch fireworks from a Kroger parking lot because that's like the nearest location. And it's the scariest thing ever because I guess they have different laws down in Kentucky because people are letting off fireworks in a Kroger parking lot. And you're like, is it going to hit me or what's going on? And they're selling fireworks in the parking lot as well, which is particularly dangerous. But it is an interesting experience, and we're glad that our youth are going back there again to serve one of the vital uh, ministries of the United Methodist Church, Henderson Settlement. Well, that is all the announcements we have for you this morning. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as Fred comes forward to lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. It is always a wonder to come together in worship and to realize this very first line. We stand before the throne of God surrounded by an innumerable throng of people gathered from every corner of earth in praise. When we sing out with joy before God our Maker, we are not alone. All the resurrected sing with us. All those whom God has called will hear the voice of the Good Shepherd, and they will follow him. So let our hungers be satisfied. Let our tears be dried. Let us turn to number 327. Crown him with many crowns. As you remain in your posture of worship, would you join with me in the prayer of St. Francis, which you can find in your hymnal on page 481. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. Talking about peace today, 
When you think about peace, you might think about calm or quiet. I've learned recently that peace can look like a lot of different things. Peace can look like pretty much whatever you want it to. It's up to you to decide. But one thing I've realized is that an excellent way to start and a great source of peace is with God. I've thought about this a lot and I work with kids six days a week. It can be hard to find peaceful moments, but not impossible. They may be few and far between, but they still exist. We've been talking a lot about how we're going to do each week one of these fruits of the spirit. Our fruit this week for my kids to try to remember is papaya. Peace is papaya. Try to remember that. We'll all try to remember it together. And I said this at the 8.30 and I've kind of decided, you guys will get me when I'm a little better, but I've decided I'm gonna wing it every week. I'm gonna have my word and my fruit and then I'm just gonna come up here and God's gonna tell me what to say. I was talking to God the other day in the car and he told me that that was gonna be what I should do. He said, get up there and I'll tell you what to say. So here I am. And today he's told me to tell you, peace begins with me. That's something one of my teachers at Highland taught me to help to soothe one of my children. Peace begins with me. I love that. It just so happened that I found that out this week when I planned on talking about peace. I think that's the best place to start. The man upstairs. Now, I said this at the 8.30 and it was a lot funnier because we were downstairs and I said, the man upstairs, I'm not talking about Pastor Caleb. <laughs> talking about God, just in case you're confused. What does peace look like to you? I'm telling you, my peace looks like playing a steel band instrument. That's kind of loud. Most people might not think of that as a peaceful time. I talked to Cora at the last service and she tells me she feels peaceful when she's playing soccer and breaking other kids' ankles. <laughs> when I say that, I don't literally mean breaking their ankles. If you've ever played a sport, she means like faking them out. But I love that. Because when I used to step onto the soccer field, everything else melts away. When I step into this building, Everything else melts away, and the only thing that's important when I walk in here is the man upstairs, again, talking about God. I promise you, you walk through that door, someone's going to say hi. Whether you're ready for it or not, whether it's early, late, however you feel, they're going to say hi and greet you with a smile. That brings me joy, that brings me peace. This building is peaceful. Maybe your, your source of peace is when you're at home and you get to play in your bedroom and your mom doesn't come knock on the door and say, hey Emily, I need you to go and clean the playroom. Hey Austin, I need you to take the trash out, right? Maybe that peaceful moment is when you close the door and you get to go and play with your toys. When mom doesn't say, hey, Ellie, come unload the dishwasher. Oh my goodness. But maybe when mom asks you to unload the dishwasher, it's so she can feel a sense of peace. See where I'm going with this? Everyone's peace is different. But the ultimate source of peace and the best way to begin is God. Exactly. Emily's got it. She can take over at this point. Peace begins with me. Love that. I encourage you to take 30 seconds of your day. I promise you have it. I know it doesn't always feel like it, but you've got 30 seconds somewhere. Peace begins with me. Peace begins with God. Think about that. Talk to him. 
in whatever way works for you. Feel that inner peace and show that to other people. Show them where your peace comes from and that you can make any situation peaceful. Even a crazy situation that seems impossible when I've got 60 kids running around the cafeteria, I take a quick second and I need to self-soothe. So I look to him. In every situation it works, look to him. Use him for your inner peace so that you can show everyone else what that looks like. So whatever peace looks like for you, I encourage you to take 30 seconds of your day this week to remember, peace begins with God. All right, Pastor Caleb's going to pray for us, so don't run away yet. Let us pray. Let us extend our arms as we pray a prayer of blessing over our children. Lord God, we thank you for your grace and for your peace. Your peace which stills our hearts and strengthens us in the way of your love. Go with our children as they learn more about the fruit of the Spirit and today your peace which you offer to all of us. We pray this in your Son's holy name. Amen. In our Friday update this week, I sent out that this morning, on this Sunday, we would have our stewardship uh, committee come and give a brief presentation about the letter that was sent out this past week. And so I invite the stewardship chair, Mark Maseshko, to come forward. You can choose whichever side. This side is not holier because I use it. it you can use that side as well. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, so as Pastor Caleb said, my name is Mark Maseczko. I'm the stewardship uh, chair here at uh, OUMC, in case the, or for those of you who don't know. Um, so I, we get to meet as a stewardship team uh, about once a month, and I meet with a great team um, with Vince Frieden, um, Caleb joins us, Jerome Conley, uh, and Reed Shoker. And uh, we get to have a great meeting and talk about the future of the church. And... Um, I'm going to share something that Jerome said. He probably wouldn't be happy that I do this, but he, he said these three things in this last meeting, and I said, I'm going to use that for my speech. Um, he said, we need to celebrate our wins, we need to be truthful about where we are, and we need to anticipate a better tomorrow. So I'm going to speak on those three things today. So celebrate the wins. We have a lot of positive momentum right now within the church. Um, within the church internally, but also uh, the work that's being done um, around the, the building. And I know that you all have seen it, um, whether it's the water fountains um, that are upstairs, downstairs in the educational room, um, the hot water over in the education room. It's nice to have hot water when you have to use the restroom to be able to wash your hands. That's really nice. Uh, and then um, the doors downstairs and the exterior there with that. Um, and. The, another win to celebrate is Reed uh, Shoker's done a great job with pricing for what we're going to start to see outside the building and the spires and the windows in the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more work done uh, on the church, which is a great thing. He's done a good job pricing things out. He's uh, been able to find a comp two companies, a window company and a, and a, a masonry company that are uh, well under the original estimate, so um, we're in good shape there. So those are definite wins. But we have to be truthful about where we are currently. Um, and as I've mentioned before, as you can kind of see the church, if you don't notice, if you go outside and take a look up, it's in a bit of disrepair up, up there. Um, the masonry works, some things, the, the windows are kind of faded and 
Uh, we have some issues. We don't have a window out front in the circle that's just a big piece of plywood um, which needs to be fixed. So there are some things that need to be done um, and we've, uh, we've def deferred those uh, too long and it's time to, to take some action. Um, and as of right now, uh, we're ahead of projections in our operational budget, which is a fantastic thing. Um, but there is a potential for a shortfall uh, at year end, so we need to be uh, conscious of that. Um, and with all of that, so we're looking at four kind of buckets of uh, streams of revenue. We've got the endowment, uh, which we'll be tapping into a little bit. Uh, the facilities fund is part of that. Um, foundations and corporations we're going to be reaching out to. Uh, those of you who got, you've seen the letters, those letters that all come from us are all uh, written by Vince Frieden, who's an outstanding writer. Um, and he's done two grants uh, recently, one for the Oxford Community Foundation, one for the Hamilton Foundation, uh, Community Foundation, and uh, we're hoping to hear back soon on those. Uh, so we're excited about that. So that's another bucket that we're looking at. We're going to do a capital campaign, which we've talked about before. Um, and we'll uh, get into more of that as we get closer to the um, consecration um, Sunday in November. And then as a last resort, um, we might have to look into doing or taking a loan to complete the projects that need to be done. Um, that's the last thing we want to do, but if we are at the point where we need to do that, we will do it um, with uh, leadership's uh, blessing to be able to complete the projects, which, as I said before, we're in a good spot with that because of all the work that Reed's done, um, and uh, we need to take advantage of that while we have the opportunity. And finally, we need to anticipate a better tomorrow. Um, this church is doing a lot of great things um, within the community, within the church body, uh, making a lot of strides in strengthening our relationship with Christ. And I said it this morning at the 830 service, but, you know, th these spires are important and they're a big part of this skyline of Oxford, Ohio. You know, I grew up here and we had a water tower and that was a big part of that too, but even that water tower was... Uh, not as high as these spires are. And if you're out at the middle school driving into town on 732, in my mind, I always thought, oh, Miami, all these towers, all that stuff, that's, that's huge. And you can see that, and you can for miles. But nothing is in, uh, as, uh, compares to these, these spires. And we want to make sure that those spires remain here and are a beacon of hope for uh, not only our community, but the surrounding communities and a place that people know that that's a, a wonderful place to worship and a place full of wonderful people. So I'll leave you with those three things. Let's celebrate our wins, let's be truthful about where we are, and let's anticipate a better tomorrow. So thank you so much. After the service, Reed and I will be in the back. If you have uh, specific questions you'd like to ask us, uh, we'll be around to answer any questions you may have. So thank you very much. That is good news indeed. You know, one of the things that I, I, it has to be said sometime during this time of our talking about fruits, God loves a good fruit salad. God brings together those different fruits in one body, one community, so that all of it is flavored by the others. There is always every gift necessary in every congregation to accomplish what God puts before us. So it's up to us to define what kind of a fruit we are. Who are we and what is our gift to be shared? So as a part of our prayer this morning, I invite you to do that and let you also know that if you would like to come forward and light a candle in prayer for someone or for yourself, Please feel free to do that as we enter into a, a quiet time of reflection, your peace.
Almighty God, we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed before that, he had said to his disciples, my peace I give to you, but not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. We confess to you that we need that peace. Our hearts are troubled. We are troubled by all that we see in the world. We're troubled by those problems in our own lives. We're troubled by illnesses that may be our own or those of people we, we love. We're troubled by many things. But we believe the promise of peace peace that is beyond what the world says, beyond our circumstances. Dear God, help us in our times of unbelief, when it is so hard to believe, when it seems that the world is falling apart. It is then that we need your presence the most. And when we finally find that presence in the midst of the horror we find our true strength and discover that we can do something about it. We can not change the circumstance, but we can change our perception of it. And therefore, we're free from it. And we have peace. So grant that to us today. Grant it to your world and make us instruments of your peace. For we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus, who has taught us a way of praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today is taken from the New Revised Standard View, and it is Ephesians the second chapter, 11 through 18. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles, that's us, by the way, by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a circumcision by the way that is made in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time without Christ. Never bump your iPad. I'll find it again. <laughs> there we go. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no more hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. This is God's gift to us for this day. Amen. Well, because we are entering what I like to call the season of 
grades. You know, because we're ending the school year and we're getting to just that time of the year where it's not even the students that are just getting grades, but professors are getting grades. Everybody seems to like grades. We're giving out evaluations for all sorts of things. Even Methodists like their grades too. I just got graded a couple weeks ago by our leadership team for my performance. So we all get graded this time of the year. And so today I want us to to think, and we're going to use the traditional A to F grading scale this morning. And I want you to grade yourself or grade these areas. The first one is grading yourself. I want you to, using the A to F grading scale, grade your current level of peace. Somebody in the first service blurted it out. You don't have to do that. Now, the second area I want you to grade, grade the level of peace in the world. So this morning, I'm not going to ask specifically how you graded yourself, but however you would say is a passing grade, how many of you gave yourself a passing grade when it comes to your level of peace? You can raise your hand if you did so. All right, that's good to see this morning. How many of you gave the world a failing grade when it comes to peace? All right. Now, here's an interesting question. How many of you gave yourself a better grade than the world? Raise your hand. That's a lot of you, right? Like it's easier, I think, to grade ourselves in our level of peace than it is to see the level of peace in the world being a good thing. And so while the peace in us might not be reflected in the world, I think it should have some presence in our own lives, and we should expect that that peace that's within us would have something to say to the peace that is not existent in the world around us. And so this morning, when we focus on the fruit of the Spirit that deals with peace, we're trying to see how is it that we can live with peace in such a way that our hearts full of peace can be reflected in the world around us. Now, to kind of give us a summary here, we are on the third week in our series on the nine fruit of the Spirit. We're going to go each week and look at a different fruit of the Spirit. And we began with love, and we then moved on to joy last week. But this week, we get peace. And I've mentioned this the last couple weeks, but the ninefold fruit of the Spirit come in three sets of three. Three triplets, in other words. You've got love, joy, and peace. Those are commonly found together in Scripture. And then you've got patience, kindness, and goodness that are often grouped together. And then faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, these aren't exhaustive of the fruit of the Spirit. We could add wisdom. We could add any other good things that the Bible mentions. But the reason why Paul focuses on these nine is to create this understanding that life in the Spirit brings an order to it. In fact, the life in the Spirit is contrasted to what? The life of the flesh, which is a life that's unbalanced, that's out of control, that's chaotic, and even at times violent. When he describes Paul in Galatians, the works of the flesh, the list is long, and it almost seems unending with all the things that he's throwing out there. But the fruit of the Spirit are intentional, they're simple, and they contrast with the way of the flesh. And so we are taking a deeper look at those because we want the structure and order of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, in our community, in our world around us. But before we get into Ephesians chapter 2 and what peace looks like, I'm going to do what I've done the last couple weeks, and that is, is get the top 10 quotes from Google on the internet about peace you know, just some famous quotes about peace. Now, I do this not just for fun, um, but I do it because it gives us a good starting point to see how people commonly think of peace, and then we can contrast it with what Scripture says about peace, and we can see if some of these quotes hold up, if some of them are good, or if some of them are not really what we want in life. So the first quote comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says, "'Nothing can bring you peace but yourself.'" Michael Cunningham says, you cannot find peace by avoiding life. Aristotle said, it is not enough to win a war. It is more important to organize the peace. Eckhart Tolle said, 
you find peace not by rearranging the circumstances of your life, but by realizing who you are at the deepest level. Robert Fulgham said, Peace is not something you wish for. It is something that you make, something you are, something you do, and something you give away. Mitch Album, the great writer, said, You have peace, the old woman said, when you make it with yourself. From Siddhartha Gautama, peace comes from within. Do not seek it without. That's kind of kind of the contrast there between the grades, right? Like if you try to seek peace out in the world, it seems pretty hard to find right now. Wayne Dwyer said, you have everything you need for complete peace and total happiness right now. The Dalai Lama, or at least one of them, world peace must develop from inner peace. Peace is not just mere absence of violence. Peace is, I think, the manifestation of human compassion. And from Albert Schweitzer, until he extends the circle of his compassion to all living things, man will not find, will not himself find peace. And we see just like joy and love, peace is a popular topic of reflection. When you consider how turbulent our world is or can be, you probably can understand why philosophers and writers spend so much time thinking about what is peace and how do we bring about peace into our lives. And I think going into the month of May, this is probably a good message to pay attention to because there's the one thing I hear in May every single year is, please don't invite me to do something during the month of May. I'm already too busy and my life is already chaotic. I don't need one more thing to do in the month of May. And so today we're going to look at Ephesians 2 to see just how God provides us with this peace. Now, like last week with joy, I believe we cannot understand what peace is without looking to God first. If we're going to understand what peace is, we have to look directly at God. After all, Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. So where else would you look? Where else would you begin but Jesus Christ? And we see in Verse 14 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul says, For he, that is Christ, is our peace. In his flesh he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. The context here is important for us to understand. There's this wall of separation that separates Jew from Gentile, uncircumcised from circumcised. And here it's not just saying that they're at war with one another. It's saying that because these people are within the covenant. These people who are outside the covenant of promise don't have a way into the future that God has for them. And what Christ does is that Christ forges a new way of being human. And how can Jesus do this? Well, he is our peace. That thing is saying two things at once. Number one, Christ is peace, and we have a share in that peace. Paul is intentional. He doesn't say Christ is peace. He says our peace. So we have a share in it. And it's important then for us to understand that Christ doesn't just fulfill a function of peace. It's fundamental to who Christ is. In other words, Christ doesn't occasionally deal in peace. It's the totality of who Christ is from beginning to end there is nothing in God that is not of peace. See, there's no indication that God or Christ could be anything different. Christ doesn't dabble in peace. And it's not something that he just does for a season. We know the passage from Ecclesiastes that says there is a time for war and a time for peace. A time to speak up and a time to be silent, a time to love, a time to hate. We see that that's the, the seasons of our existence. But in God, there are no seasons. In God, it is always peace and bringing that peace into the world. We think of God as being at peace with God's self. When we talk about the, the Trinity, and I don't like calling it the Trinity. I prefer to call it the triune God. And I know that probably sounds like I'm splitting hairs that I do not have on the top of my head. But triune God seems a lot more personal than Trinity. Like, it just doesn't sound right. But when we talk about the triune God, we're talking about a God who is complete in God's self. 
There is no conflict between the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. There is no anxiety. There is no need. There is only peace and wholeness. That's who God is. I mean, that's such a contrast to us. In us, there's always a, a feeling of conflict or a feeling of anxiety, but God doesn't have that. God is peace through and through. And so because Christ is peace, what is within God is meant to be experienced in us. So God wants the peace that is God to be present in our lives. That's why we can be confident that the fruit of the Spirit is peace, because God is letting us have, through Jesus, what God already has in God's self. And when we're connected to God, what is in God becomes a reality in us. This is why I want to claim to you this morning, friends, that we don't just live with the possibility of peace, we live with the reality of peace. Because that's who God is, and that's what God has given us in Christ Jesus. Now, when we think of that, we're like, oh, man, I would want more of that, that peace in the, my life and in the world around us. But peace is not a possession. It's a reality. It's a gift that God gives and brings, and we want to be in contact or connected with that God. And this is the reason why, as, as people of faith, we don't tremble or fear the disorder of this world. And the reason why we don't fear the disorder of this world is not because of anything in us or some leader or some program or government or military or anything. We are confident because of what is ours in Christ. For he is our peace. And the peace of Christ then is not just something about who God is, but also what God does for us. This is what we learn in the next verse. And one of the reasons why I use this text is that it treats the cross not just as an instrument of peace in our relationship with God, but also as one that tears down the hostility that we have be between one another. It's not just about a relationship with God, in other words. It's about a relationship with one another. See, in verse 15, this Christ who is our peace is about the business of abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. Now, some care needs to be taken here to understand what is going on. Paul is not saying that the law is bad and needs to be thrown out. That's not what he means when he talks about abolishing the law. Nor is he saying that Jewish people need to give up being who they are. Paul never stopped following the law of the Torah. He never stopped being Jewish. Nor did Jesus, really. Jesus even said, not one part of this law will go away. I've not come to abolish the law. What Paul is saying is simply that the Gentiles are included in the covenant, not because of the law or that they need to abide by the law, but because of what Jesus Christ did. So their access to this covenant comes not through the law, but comes through Jesus Christ himself. That's why he's saying that Jesus makes peace. The law, under the influence of sin and death, created this wall of separation and thus increased the conflict and always increases the conflicts in our lives. But Christ, who is our peace, makes peace. The only thing bringing together these two distinct people is Jesus Christ himself. See, the cross is not just an instrument that brings peace in our relationships with God, but in our relationships with others. I think this is a kaleidoscopic vision of peace. Differences are not diminished or eradicated. This peace is a peace even in dimensions 
We talk about our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationship with others. But I also think this piece is in 3D and even in 4D. That is that it's available across all time from the moment you're born to the moment you die. That same piece is available to us. And in the first service I mentioned, uh, my wife hates when I reference this particular movie, but there's the scene in the movie Interstellar, and some of you know where I'm going with this, where Matthew McConaughey's character goes through a black hole. I know, it sounds trippy, right? He goes through a black hole, and he's in a place where he's outside of time, and he can see time like a 3D structure, and he can move moment to moment. I know, I've lost all of you. It's even more confusing when you see it on the screen, too. But he can go through moments of his life. And when I'm saying, like, peace is available across time, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, to God, all of it is there. And God makes that same peace to all of us. Not even time itself can create a wall of separation from the peace that is in Jesus Christ. And so we see that Christ is our peace and that that Christ makes peace in every way through the cross. But Paul doesn't end there. He says that God who is peace and made peace also proclaims peace. Verse 17, so he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. The peace of God which God makes with all people near and far is therefore a message that is proclaimed to all people near and far. Those who near are near, of course, are Jewish people, and those who are far, in this sense, would be the Gentiles. In other words, all people. The reality of peace is the message of peace that we proclaim. See, as followers of Jesus Christ, who made peace and is our peace, it is not our responsibility to proclaim war or division or violence or hostility. See, I think many want to limit what the fruit of the Spirit means when it comes to peace. They, they want this peace only to be a peace about our relationship with God. Read Romans 5.1. They don't want it to be a peace that is shared across the community, maybe even outside the walls of the church, because then that gives them the excuse not to be peaceful in their relationships with people they don't like. I don't have to be peaceful to you because you're not a Christian like me. Now, I, saw, now I think some of the reason why they do this, and I think I'm going to be generous um, in, in doing this, um, I think it's based on what they think they read and Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, where Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I mean, how can that be? We just read in Ephesians that Christ is our peace and is proclaiming this peace to those who are far off and those who are near. That seems like Jesus has brought peace to the earth. So what is he, Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 10? Well, the context here is important. In this particular context of Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is giving what many call the missionary discourse, where he is talking about the result of the mission work that the disciples are going to be doing in the world, and that this message that God is bringing of the kingdom of God coming to the earth will divide families from one another. And so sword here represents division, not violence. In fact, I always say, beware of those who will use Scripture to justify violence of any kind. Not because Scripture can't be used that way. We know, I mean, you can use Scripture for whatever reason you want to come up with. I think many of us know this, and many of people have captured this. I think of that famous part of To Kill a Mockingbird where Atticus Finch is talking with his kids, I think, and he, he talks about the person, sometimes the person walking down the street with a Bible in their hand is more dangerous than the person walking down the street with a whiskey bottle in their hand. Because we know that scripture can be used or in various ways to justify violence. But the gospel reframes our use of scripture 
away from a message of violence to a message of peace, away from a message of division to a message of unity, away from a message of exclusion to a message of inclusion. When reading scripture, friends, don't forget the gospel. That's what Paul is proclaiming here. He's saying the one who is our peace and has made peace through the cross also proclaims that peace to those who are near and far. To say, in other words, that one of the fruit of the Spirit is peace reflects not only the reality of who Christ is and what Christ has done, but also the reality of who we are being shaped to become as disciples of Jesus Christ. We should live by the message of peace. So much so that we embody this peace. It becomes one with our way of existence. Think this morning, what would happen if we spoke not just words of peace, but words that brought peace? So that every word that comes from our mouths is meant to bring peace into the world rather than deny the world of it. Think about our actions. What if every single action we took in the world was one of peace? And we know, like, we can try to be as peaceful as we can, but other people are in this equation too. And that's why Paul says in Romans, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. There's that acknowledgement that sometimes it's hard to be in a peaceful relationship with people who don't want to bring peace to you. But still, imagine what it would be like if all of our actions were geared towards peace. Imagine what our witness would be as a church if we were ones of peace, not of division or violence or hatred. I mean, just imagine that for a moment. I think some Christians, they get so caught up on this idea, mainly through misinterpreting Matthew 10, verse 34, that Scripture just gives them an excuse to be a bunch of jerks. And thus, by doing so, we deny true witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God calls us to something greater than that. And imagine what our community would be. What would happen if we were all about peace? I mean, we can ask the what-if questions all day long, but if we share in the fruit of the Spirit, then we should already know that this is a reality in us. And that's why I think we have a unique challenge today. And this challenge comes in two parts. The first part, I'm going to ask you to think of yourself again. You're going to get, we're going to get personal here. And the second part is about us getting it together as a church. Because often we imagine what kind of peace um, we would have in our lives if only something happened. And often we think of in our world, peace would happen if only, insert, whatever you think is going to bring that about. But perhaps it would be better to provide this. Two things. What do you need to stop doing? And what do you need to start doing to experience more peace? Think about it. What do I need to stop doing to increase my peace? And what do I need to start doing to experience more of that peace? And then I want you to think of us as a church. What do we need to stop doing as a church? And what do we need to start doing as a church in order to experience more peace? That's the challenge before us today. But remember, the Spirit is key here. The Spirit brings the power to stop. It doesn't matter if you don't have the strength to stop it. God's Spirit does. And the Spirit is also the one that has the power to bring these things, to jumpstart our lives in the way of peace. So don't think you can get out of it this morning by just saying, well, you know, I can't do that. Of course you can't do that. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's what God is doing in and through us that really matters. And so this morning, as we sing our final hymn together, um, I want you to start thinking about what you need to stop doing and start doing, what we need to stop doing as a church and start doing as a church to experience more peace.
because this hymn speaks to the Spirit's gifts which are available to all of us that we might go forth in the way of peace. And so would you rise in body or in spirit at this time as we sing together hymn number 336. We're going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. Two things before my benediction this morning. Number one, to our college students, uh, we have a lunch for you available downstairs at the conclusion of our service today. And also remember, next Sunday, only one service. It's our all-sung service here at 1030. Uh, we invite you to partake in that service that day. Well, friends, we are challenged to go forth in peace. As the hymn says, our clearest purpose is to share love, joy, and peace. So as we go today, may we proclaim the goodness of God's peace, which is available to those who are near and those who are far. May we embody that peace with our words, our action, and our witness. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us make ourselves an offering to God as we sing our doxology together. <laughs>